Yes, I did. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I just got flashed from back there, so I knew I had to wake up. Anyway, today we're going to talk about the natural and the cultural history of Cape Verde. Uh, we're going to visit our, uh, the port of call is actually at the city of Mindelo, and we're going to talk a little bit about the island of Sao Vicente. Uh, I'm still Don, and uh, you can call me happy. I'm not happy? Yes, I am happy. Anyway, Cape Verde is an island that's only a little bit larger than the state of Rhode Island in the, in the U.S. Name comes from the nearby Cap Verde uh, on the coast of Senegal. The Senegalese, uh, Senegalese Cape was originally named Cabo Verde when it was first sighted by Portuguese explorers. And the Portuguese called these islands the Ladies of the West. I think that's kind of a nice little name. Anyway, today the more common name Cape Verde is, or Cape Verde, is used by most English speakers. Uh, but in 2013, the local government, the government here, determined that the Portuguese term Cabo Verde uh, would be used for all official purposes. I'll use Cape Verde because I'm more used to that. Uh, the Republic of Cabo Verde, or Cape Verde, is an archipelago of about 10 volcanic islands and they're located some 350 miles or about 570 kilometers to the west of the coast of Africa. Uh, the islands make up a volcanic archipelago that was uh, formed as a part of the African plate and that, that formed as that thing moved across the hot spot. Now you remember we talked about hot spots the other day, so uh, uh, if you need to know more about that, meet me after the talk and I'll discuss it. Mount Fogo on the island of Fogo is the highest point in the archipelago. It reaches an elevation of about 3,000 meters or a little over 9,800 square feet or 9,800 feet. She's making faces at me over here. <clears throat> the caldera is about 8 kilometers or 5 miles in diameter. And the magma chamber below the volcano is about eh, 5 miles uh, beneath the surface. So it's not that far down. Mount Fogo most recently erupted in 1951, then again in 1995, and most recently back in 2014. Uh, it's the youngest and most active volcano island in the archipelago. In the Cape Verde archipelago, the islands are younger at the western end uh, because of plate movement, and they have been dated to about 180 million years old. So even though they're new, they're not that new. Sao Vicente's highest point is Mount Verde with an altitude of about 725 meters. And I'll tell you, when you're driving up the little narrow road that goes up the side of that mountain, it looks like it's a lot further up. And when you look down, it looks a lot further down. Anyway, it's thought that Mount Verde uh, probably got its name from the days when they had corn and green beans that were grown all over its slopes. Uh, the mountain today, due to a very dry environment, has taken on this kind of a reddish uh, brown rock debris color. And there's been a lot of erosion that's taken place and some of the craters though still remain, particularly near where we're going to be in the Bay of Mendel. Uh, when you go up on that mountain, as you get near the top, you will see some corn or maize fields along with some bean fields and you're going to just really be amazed at how hard these people work to raise their crops because obviously they don't use equipment to plant or to harvest their, their crops. And though Cape Verde Islands are almost all volcanic in origin, they vary widely in their terrain. They have extensive salt flats. They have arid slopes on some of them. They have sugarcane fields and banana plantations that are found on the neighboring islands, not so much here on Cape Verde. Uh, when it was first discovered, uh, basically the plant covering over the island was mostly made up of things like dry forest and scrub habitat. But in the 500 years since the humans first uh, colonized the islands, uh, natural habitat loss has been severe. These are domestic goats, but there are still a lot of feral goats here that are the descendants of some of the early domestic goats that were introduced by the Portuguese. By 1747, deforestation and overgrazing destroyed nearly all of the ground vegetation. The use of very poor farming practices caused the ground to basically be eroded, and the soil was gone, so things didn't grow very well. And as a result, the far islands have been hit with the first of several of many droughts. Most people go, well, why does vegetation have anything to do with drought? Well, it's kind of a cycle. Uh, 
And, and if you study the Amazon, you'll understand that the, one of the big concerns is as we cut the Amazon jungle, we're cutting down the amount of water that actually ends up in the atmosphere. In the 18th and 19th century, three droughts were so severe that over 100,000 people starved to death here on the islands. And since then, there have been drought conditions that cycle about every five years. So they go through a five-year drought, and then they'll get a little bit of rain, and then five more years of dry. Coral reefs are found extensively around the islands, and marine species here include porpoises, barracudas, moray eels, and five species of marine turtles. Uh, turtles migrate here from across the Atlantic to breed from May until October, so unfortunately we're not at the peak uh, season. But you may see a straggler or two if you keep your eyes open. Uh, the most prominent species are the endangered loggerhead sea turtles, and that's a picture of one of them right there. Eighteen species of whales, dolphins, and porpoise have been recorded in the waters here, and the area is one of two known breeding grounds for the northern hemisphere uh, humpback whales. Uh, they migrate annually here from January until mid-May, and they come down from up in the North Sea. Back during the 19th century, the humpback whale population uh, was limited, due, became limited because of very heavy overhunting. Remember, we used to hunt whales for oil. Uh, by 1993, the total North Atlantic population of hum humpbacks had rebounded to about 10,000 individuals, but they really don't have a good idea what the population here in the Cape Verde area is. Cape Verde has over 100 species of migrant birds who visit the islands each year, and it also has many species of endemic birds. Now, this little bird, the Lago Sparrow, uh, it's one of them. Uh, it kind of looks like a sparrow you see all over the place, but it was first collected by Charles Darwin during the voyage of the Beagle back in 1832. Now, Darwin, among other things, also made some very detailed observations of cuttlefish. You know, those are little, like, sea creatures. Anyway, and those were, he found them in the tidal pools around the island. He was fascinated with their ability to change color depending on whether they were threatened and all of the things that were happening in their life. And then he was a little bit disappointed later on when he learned that it was already known to most of the people in natural science. The only indigenous mammal on the island is a Sal Vicente long, gray long-eared bat. Uh, now, I'll tell you, that bat is not that big. <laughs> so if you're out in the evening, which we probably won't be, but if you were out at night and you, this thing swooped towards you, it wouldn't scare you because the body is a little smaller than a common house mouse. Anyway... Bat species on the island, uh, they account for about 20% of all the mammals that are found here. Rodent populations were introduced here by early ships that visited the islands, and monkeys were brought here uh, when they started bringing slaves from the African continent. Sal Vicente was discovered on St. Vincent's Day back in 1462, and that's how it got its name. Now, due to the lack of water, the island was initially used only for cattle pasture by some of the landowners and, and cattle farmers that were on a neighboring island. The winds and ocean currents in the region had a lot to do with who first came here. Uh, they were perhaps moors or fishermen from Guiana uh, on the coast, or Guinea over on the coast. Local legend indicates that the islands have been visited by I Arabs uh, who came here to get salt. Now, those stories may have tied to the nearby island that's called Sal Island. At the time, Portugal was actively exploring the Atlantic coast of Africa. And as you know, they were seeking a direct route to get to Asia, uh, at least by sea. The explorers were fueled by ambitions of a young man named Prince Henry the Navigator. Now, you kind of remember him. He has that funny-looking statue as you're coming out of Lisbon. Uh, he also founded the School of Navigators there. But when Cape Verde was discovered by the Europeans, it was totally uninhabited. It was 30 years before Columbus first sailed from Spain to the New World. The Reconquista movement in Spain at the time was trying to recover Catholic or Christian lands from the Muslim Moors. The Spanish Inquisition emerged as a leader in anti-Semitism. Uh, the Inquisition spread to nearby Portugal. There, Kings John the second and uh, Manuel the first decided to exile thousands of Jews from Portugal and they sent them to Sao Tome, Principe and Cape Verde. 
There's a bronze statue of the Portuguese navigator, Diago Alfonso, that was erected by Mandelo's Bayfront. In fact, one of the shuttle stops is right behind this statue. Uh, Alfonso, uh, Alfonso participated in the European discovery of Cape Verde back in the middle 15th century. The Portuguese used slave labor here to grow cotton and indigo. That slave labor wasn't here because they were using it to transport them. They brought them here to work the plantations because the land had been previously uninhabited. They then traded those goods for more slaves that were captured by lo local African warlords and also on raids by the Portuguese. Those first slaves from here were sold in Europe and beginning much later on in the 16th century, as John discussed earlier, they were sold in the Americas. Portugal laid claim to the region and soon it became known as Portuguese Guinea. The settlement of Mandelo was actually founded, the little city of Mandelo wasn't founded until 1795. The Cape Verde Islands were used to get salt from natural tidal lagoons. And on, on one side of the island here, you can see these salt pans that still exist, and they still use them. By the 16th century, mar mariners would stop here to get water. They would get meat from the cattle farms as well as some fruit. Uh, but when they got here, they found that pirates uh, would often plunder, pillage, and rob them. Englishman Sir Francis Drake, uh, acting as a privateer, uh, twice sacked the archipelago's capital city. Now, he had a letter of mark, okay? All that was was a license from the queen that said, go forth and raid Spanish and Portuguese territories, and we'll forgive you if you get captured as a pirate. <laughs> it was a license to do bad things. Anyway, positioned on the routes between Africa, Europe, and the New World, the Cape Verde Archipelago prospered from transatlantic slave trade. Once that got going, this became a very important way stop. Uh, from the viewpoint of European history, the Guinea coast is associated mainly with slavery. One of the alternative names for this whole area was the Slave Coast. Beginning back in 1810, though, whaling vessels came here from New England in the United States mostly from New Bedford and places like that. And this is the restored uh, Charles W. Morgan. That's a whaling ship that sailed out of Massachusetts. The ships often recruited crews here from the islands, and as a result, many Cape Verdeans uh, emigrated to New England. So when you go to New England, you'll find several uh, enclaves of uh, Cape Verdean people. Uh, England's interest in the region kind of declined uh, after the Brit British got out of the slave trade. Uh, the European scramble for Africa really began in about 1880. Uh, Portuguese, Portugal's main rivals here were the French. The French wanted to get in here and, and have a real strong point. And they were colonial neighbors along the west coast of uh, Africa. And Portugal held on to Guinea, and the French had both sides. Uh, the Portuguese presence wasn't disputed by the French. What was disputed were the borders themselves. So after a lot of negotiation, they finally settled on where the borders would be and where Portuguese Guinea would be and where French Guinea would be. By 1884, submarine communication cables were laid between Europe, America, Africa, and India, and that made Mandelo, surprisingly, a very important communication center for the British. One of the cables, in fact, there's still remnants of the cable station that's right on the shore here at Cape Verde. Uh, one of those cables came up here, and that brought about a pretty good per, uh, period of prosperity for the islands because there were a lot of job opportunities that brought about things for the local laborers. 19th century saw the beginning of the steamship era, and Cape Verde became an excellent place for ships to obtain coal, water, and, of course, meat. Uh, that was because of its location on the Atlantic Ocean's major shipping lanes. That, back at that time, it was the closest place to get between South America and Africa, where you could actually have an island to replenish. Uh, the British East India Company established Mandelo's Harbor as a major coaling station for their ships. And that was soon followed by the Royal Mail Steam Packet Company, who also built facilities here. Uh, Mandelo exploded in population. It reached 1,400 people by 1850. There's a few more than that there now. Uh, but Portugal really didn't do anything in that era and probably through most of its life to help its colony. 
Uh, Cape Verde suffered from frequent droughts, famine, epidemic diseases, and of course there were always the ever-present volcanic eruptions. Lucrative slave trade declined throughout the 19th century and the local economy fell as did the island's prosperity. Once people were no interested in, in moving slaves about, there wasn't anything to buy or sell here. Thousands of people died of starvation during the first half of the 20th century caused by drought and famine. The uh, colonial heyday of Cape Verde had come to an end. In 1926, the Portuguese government was basically a dictator, dictatorship under Antonio Salazar. He looked at the colonies strictly as an economic frontier. Well, one of the things he didn't do is he didn't think about the local issues, and that caused quite a bit of resentment across all of the islands. Now, that dictatorship and the following government after Salazar died lasted until about 1974. During World War II, the number of ships calling at Cape Verde dropped dramatically. Uh, that was for a couple reasons. One, because it was a really easy place to target ships by the submarines. And the other was because ships were shifting from coal to oil, so they didn't have to stop here to get coal. They could just go other places and get oil, and there wasn't any oil here for them anyway. And that caused the coal industry and those coaling stations on the island to collapse. The British companies abandoned their interest on the islands, and that was really the final blow to the local economy. After the war, Portugal remained intent on just holding on to their former colonies. I mean, here you have a little country that had these colonies all around Africa, and they really didn't want to let them go. In 1951, Portugal changed the island's designation to that of an overseas territory. There was a nationalist group that was called the Party for the Independence of Guinea and Cape Verde, or PAIGC, was formed in 1956. Uh, that began what was a really long campaign for independence by, uh, for the islands. Their first major activity was instigating a dock workers' strike for better salaries over in Guinea, not out on the islands. And the police over there opened fire on the striking workers, killing about 50 people. Following that massacre, several PAIGC uh, members decided that uh, nonviolent protest just wasn't going to work. Uh, so they believed that the only hope for independence was through armed conflict. The result was a 13 year war in Guinea between Soviet backed PAIGC members and the Portuguese and African troops. Uh, that struggle would ultimately lead to independence for Cape Verde and all of Portuguese Africa. The Carnation Revolt was a coup in Lisbon that occurred in 1974. Its name, the Carnation Revolution or Revolt, refers to the fact that people took to the streets to celebrate the end of the dictatorship and war in the colonies. They took red carnations and they put them in the muzzles of the rifles and the cannons and pinned them to the uniforms of the soldiers. Some of you who re might remember back in the 60s, there was a similar sort of activity that took place in the States particularly around the Pentagon. Uh, there is some debate as to whether the Carnation Revolution forced the government in Lisbon to negotiate with the PAIGC, but nonetheless, uh, by July of 1975, Cape Verde had become independent from Portugal. From the mid-1990s, droughts cut the uh, island's grain crop, and as you, when you go there, you'll see this grain crop is, is pretty sparse to begin with, but it was cut by about 80%. And the government appealed for international food aid after that harvest failed. Uh, recently, they've embarked on a major expansion of Cape Verde's port and airport facilities, and they're moder modernizing their fish processing industry. Uh, those projects are being partly paid for by the U EU and the World Bank, and that makes Cape Verde one of the largest per capita aid recipients in the world. Uh, it must be working, though, because in 2008, Cape Verde became only the second country uh, to be taken off of the United Nations list of the 50 least developed countries in the world. The Liberal Party in Cape Verde was established back in 1990, and it was rule the ruling party here until 2001, and then a lot of disenchantment with government's privatization programs and continued high unemployment and so on saw them get defeated in elections. 
But they pretty soon have come back to power, and should their elected leader, this woman named Janera Hopfer Amata, uh, be elected in the 2016 general election, she'll become the prime minister of Cape Verde, one of the first women prime ministers in African history. Cape Verde was the first country to develop a European Creole culture. Uh, that's a unique mixture of European and African people. Today, 78% of the island's population is Creole. The remainder, 21% is black and 1% is white. Now, there's very little class distinction in Cape Verde because the vast majority, and I'm talking about a huge majority of this population, is very poor. There's a small but growing middle class here, if you will, in the towns and the cities, but virtually no upper class. Uh, those with higher socioeconomic backgrounds tend to identify themselves culturally with Europe. Uh, they tend to think of themselves as more European. I love this. Why? Because they may have traveled abroad, not because they have any other tie. Uh, a genetic survey here studied uh, the, the people of Cape Verde, and they found the an ancestry of the population in Cape Verde is predominantly European on the male side and African or West African on the female side. Because remember, back in the early colonial days, the men who came out here as explorers and as the first colonizers, they didn't bring their wives and families. They came by themselves and they took African wives. The high degree of ethnic and genetic mix uh, of individuals is a result of centuries of European explorers and those ethnic migrations. Here it is very common, it's not unusual at all, to encounter people with very dark skin, yet blonde hair and blue eyes. And when you first see them, it kind of makes you go, wait a minute. Uh, the other also occurs, people with almost pure white skin with black hair and very dark eyes. Uh, the majority of the population here is quite young. Two-thirds of them are under the age of 30. Only 8.5% of the population is over the age of 60 and the rest of them kind of fit in the middle. So they don't fit our demographic from this ship at all. Because <laughs> we're all younger than that, right? You got it. Anyway, today more people with origins in Cape Verde live outside the country than live inside it. And you can really see why. This is not an uncommon scene, and you'll see this. It looks like the favelas from Brazil and from other places that we visited. Cape Verdeans that live abroad send considerable amounts of money home, and it makes a significant contribution to the country's economy and to their gross national product. The money that is sent home brings in very much needed foreign currency. Now, with that said, nonetheless, Cape Verde enjoys a per capita income that is higher than many of the continental African nations and has sought closer economic ties with both the U.S. and EU, as well as back with Portugal. Today, agriculture here is at the subsistence level in the Cape Verde Islands. Only 10% of the land is arable. And some of you may go out into their major uh, agricultural valley, and you'll see exactly what that 10% looks like. It's still pretty sparse. Uh, it can only supply about one-fifth of the island's food needs but agriculture accounts for about one-third of their economy, and services and transportation account for a half. Uh, the shift is due partly because of the growth, surprisingly, in tourism. Uh, they've brought in a few luxury hotels and resorts on several of the islands, and that is bringing in a little bit more money for the country. But most of the, most of the rest of it comes from the United States, Portugal, Holland, surprisingly enough, and other countries in Western Europe. Labor in Cape Verde is not usually divided along gender lines. Women and men both do very heavy physical labor. Uh, but ladies, unfortunately, domestic work is still exclusively a feminine domain. Uh, women are often the sole financial support for their families because there are a relatively large number of uh, single women uh, parents. Yet they're proportionately underrepresented in the white-collar professions and the political system here. While the genders are recognized as equal under the law, there are very broad disparities in the rights and power. Uh, women, mothers in particular, are respected for the immense workload that they carry, but 
In almost every instance, they must defer to men. Uh, women take care of cleaning, cooking, and child rearing, and at the same time, they also have to make a substantial contribution in several sectors of the workforce that includes farming, construction, and commerce. So women are a really important part of this society. The Constitution here bans di gender discrimination, but social discrimination and violence against women persist. The penal code has been amended to broaden the definition of sexual abuse and increases the penalties. Domestic violence against women is still commonplace on the islands, and societal values discourage reporting these criminal offenses. So if a woman is abused, she just can't go to the police. Discrimination in the workplace continues in hiring, pay, and promotion, and women are often unaware of their rights, mostly because many of them are uneducated. They suffer unjust treatment in, in things like inheritance, uh, family, and custody issues. But in 2004, there were very active uh, women's organizations that were founded and began to work to address all of those issues. Mothers here oftentimes, you've seen this probably throughout West Africa, they tie their small babies to their backs and carry them along as they work. Uh, children will frequently follow the same trade as their parents, and they often begin work at a very young age. Uh, a lot of times here, there'll be almost preschool kids that will be working, particularly true if they come from farming or fishing families. Older people here uh, don't really have the advantage of a social security program, so they'll work as long as they are able to do it. It's not unusual to see men and women in their 70s harvesting beans or hauling rocks at a construction site. So if you feel that you have a hard life here on board in, uh, Insignia, ask one of these people if you can take their job for a day. <laughs> I don't think you'll like it. Legal and church weddings here are very uncommon. Uh, more often than not, the woman will simply leave her family's home and move in with her boyfriend. After about four years uh, of cohabitation, the relationship has the status of common law here on the island. Uh, polygamy is not legal in Cape Verde, uh, but it is customary for a man, married or not, to be sleeping with more than one woman at a time. So guys, you know, don't let your wife get too far away because she'll hear things you don't want her to hear. Anyway, the local people have a very communal attitude toward property and they freely borrow and lend possessions. And maybe that's where this whole uh, off-the-record polygamy comes from. Traditionally, several generations of a family uh, will live together in the same house. And there are a great many houses, as I said, that are led by single mothers. Childbearing is communal, and living situations are very fluid. Uh, children often stay with their aunts and uncles or other relatives, especially during the school year. Uh, here, people stand very close together when they talk, and they are very physically demonstrative. Uh, men, as well as women, are often seen touching or holding hands. Uh, they form, their forms of greeting are kind of interesting because it includes like shaking hands for men and kissing for women. But the, the greetings are often quite lengthy. I mean, you'll see people meet and they'll talk for quite a while just saying, Hi, how are you? How's the family? How's the dog? You know, did your corn sprout or whatever? And then if they meet again later in the day, they go through that same ritual all over again. So they just like to talk to each other and be together. And that interplay also will include inquiries about each other's health and family and everything else about them. It's kind of an interesting way to look at stuff. Seven days after a baby is born here, the parents will throw a big party that's called a seta. Uh, like any other party, there's an occasion for a little bit of dancing and maybe just a spot or two of drinking. At midnight on that day, the guests all file into the baby's room so the little kid isn't going to get a good night's sleep. Anyway, they sing to it as a protection against evil spirits. And the kid gets picked up and coddled and held by all the people that are jammed into his, his or her room. Uh, despite Cape Verde's uh, relatively non-spiritual atmosphere, they do have rituals that surround death, and those are very strictly observed here. Uh, funerals are very, very large events, um, and they're attended by almost everybody in the local community. 
The procession is accompanied by mourners who perform a very highly stylized musical wailing. And, and in some ways, you could almost think of it as a funeral in places like New Orleans or something, where you have a little bit of a parade that's got this special music that goes on in the background. Family members of the deceased person have to dress in black for a full year after the death, and those particular people are forbidden to dance or play music. Corn is a staple food of Cape Verde, and as I said, you'll see these very, very rugged cornfields if you go up to the top of the mountain. Uh, women usually spend a few days prior to any feast or festival pounding the corn for cachupa. Uh, that's basically the national dish, and it's a stew that's made of the corn hominy, some beans, and whatever meat and other vegetables they might have available. A uh, traditional breakfast here is usually something like steamed cornbread, and that's eaten with honey and milk and served with coffee. Uh, they also call this, this morning breakfast thing couscous, which is not couscous like we think of it, but it's couscous here. Uh, Cape Verdeans generally eat a very large lunch in the mid-afternoon and then a very small late dinner. They are very generous and hospitable people, and even the poorest among these people take pride in offering any of their guests a meal. And here on the islands, it is considered rude to eat in front of others uh, without sharing whatever you have. Uh, for that reason, you're not going to see anybody eating in public out on the street or while riding on a bus or whatever. And for that reason, that's probably why you're not going to see a McDonald's on every block and a Starbucks every other block. Uh, they just don't have those kind of activities here. You may be invited to drink an alcoholic beverage that's called grok or grug by the locals. Uh, it's made of sugar cane, and it uses up nearly all of the sugar cane production on the island. Uh, it's a very popular drink among the men on the island. On the plus side, grog is also used as a base for medicinal pre preparations and where they add some herbs such as common rue and rosemary and anise. Uh, it's even one preparation that has barnacles in it. I just can't picture having a cocktail that's got barnacles in it. And I think another use might be as a paint remover. <laughs> grog is also the basis of a Cape Verdean cocktail known as punch. And I... Um, I'm trying to remember if the last time we were here a month ago on the, on the tour that people were offered punch. I think they were. Uh, those that were really brave ended up in sick bay. No. <laughs> uh, but they were offered it. And the punch, it basically is It's kind of like uh, uh, a drink that's got lime and molasses and things like that in it. Uh, after drinking punch, of course, you may feel like dancing or you might want to go up and sing in the karaoke. Uh, the island's dance music here includes several native forms. Uh, one of the favorites is the Funana. Uh, Funana is danced as kind of a sexual mix of African and Portuguese culture. Uh, partners embrace each other and they perform these animated, quick, pretty strong flexing of the knees. And I'm not going to do it because I'll just fall down. Anyway, in rural areas, the dancers' bodies are pretty much inclined. Uh, to the front, and only their shoulders touch, or only shoulders are in contact. In the cities, the dance is a little more stylized. I guess the people are a little more comfortable with each other because the bodies are more vertical and the chests are in contact. The words of the Funana are talk about everyday situations, uh, the sorrows and the happinesses of life, if you will, social criticism, and very idyllic situations. And the lyrics often use uh, figures of speech, proverbs, and popular sayings on the island. And it's kind of part of their indigenous culture here. Cape Verde is also known internationally for a, a music called the morna. It's a form of folk music usually sung uh, in the native Creole here. It's accompanied by clarinet, violin, guitar, and the cavaquino. A cavaquino is a small stringed instrument. You can see one in the front here. It kind of looks like a ukulele. Uh, it's a little more complex than a ukulele, but it looks like it. The themes of the Morna are a little more varied than for the Fortuna or for the Fuana. Uh, beside universal topics like, you know, little simple things like love and, you know, return and all that kind of stuff. One of the things they do here in this particular form of music is they kind of mourn the people who have left Cape Verde. Or they 
celebrate the return of someone who's gone away. Uh, a lot of times it's a nostalgic or melancholic longing for the absence of someone who is loved and has gone. And sometimes it's from death. Now, when you visit Cape Verde, this is kind of a warning for those of you who may want to stop at the casino for a little thing or you want to do a little gambling on shore. You'll see people huddled around a small game board. And I know you've seen these little game boards almost all over West Africa. Uh, usually, it'll be play, they'll be playing a game called Oril. Uh, rarely will you see women playing this game. They usually take care of the finances, so they don't want to play. Anyway... <laughs> This was carried to the island by slaves who came here from Senegal and the Gambia during the Portuguese colonial period. Uh, today, it's often used in the local schools to teach arithmetic, and it's very popular among the students, mostly the boys. It's played on a board with two rows, and each row represents one player. Uh, at the beginning of the game, each of those little cups has four stones or seeds or whatever in it, uh, the object of the game is to capture more seeds than your opponent. And it seems like a pretty simple game, but they'll explain it to you. They'll come over and say, come on over, we'll show you how to play. But let me warn you, hold on to your wallet. Because when they say, well, would you like to play for a dollar? You might just as well hand them to the dollar because they're going to play so fast you won't even know what hit you. And then they'll go, oh, that was just a fluke. We didn't mean to to go that fast. Maybe we could play for $2. <laughs> but it'll be faster than you could even imagine. Now, we're going to dock at Porto Grande. That's the main port of uh, Cape Verde. Uh, and this is the port that most of the country's imports come and go through. Uh, it's pretty much within walking distance of the town, but it's a terminal that has a lot of containers and, and silos for grain and, and so on and refrigeration units, and that makes it very difficult to find your way on and off of the pier. And a shuttle is usually provided that will take you into town, as I said, by that statue. It's also right next to the Bellum Tower. It's also next to it, if you're really into it, the fish market. Uh, and it's easy to find once you get off the shuttle. All you have to do is inhale. Uh, and what else is there to see or do here? There's a market that sells clothing, carvings, and jewelry, and it's uh, at the site that used to be an African slave market. And while the local markets are quite interesting, occasionally the negotiations of, of, uh, uh, for an item might become a little bit of a hassle. So some sellers start to use some pretty high-pressure sales tactics to get you to buy things. Uh, you just look the vendor in the eye, and here it works. I know it works. And, and you just calmly say, no stress and they'll back right down, and then it'll get to be a normal negotiation, and if you don't want to buy it, just walk away. Anyway, also try the Centro Nacional de Arsanto, Arta Santo. Uh, it's a museum that features fabrics by famous local artists, as well as some carpet-like art and some wooden ha uh, handicrafts. The gallery displays paintings and ceramics as well. You may see a small replica of Lisbon's Belém Tower close to the harbor as we sail in. It's right next to the Alfonso uh, statue. Uh, it's a Wor UNESCO World Heritage Site. This one isn't. The one in Lisbon is. Um, and that's because of a significant role. They built this one because of a significant role the Portuguese played uh, during the Age of Discoveries in getting to these islands. Uh, the original tower was commissioned as a part of the de defensive system for Lisbon, this one is just a symbol. Uh, the Mandelo version is just to basically honor the Portuguese uh, and to honor Sal Vicente. Uh, and it was basically placed to just make the Portuguese colonists feel at home. And I'm sure that when you're here and you get a chance to interface at all with the local people, you'll find them to be quite pleasant. Uh, and they're very hospitable people. But that's not to say that you're going to find everything to be the way you want it to be. So I'd like you to please watch the evening currents for my next presentation. And uh, I, I guess the next one's, I don't know when it is. The schedule keep, no, it doesn't keep changing. Um, I can tell you what it is, though. It's going to be Ships and Explorers Part 1. It's a little bit of a, a segue between some of the stuff that Roger's talked about and some of the things I've talked about in the past. This one uh, will be on Channel 9 on your television. And I'll meet anybody that wants to chat with me for a few minutes out in uh, Barista's where I grab a cup of coffee. 
I hope you have a great time at Cape Verde. It's a neat island. It's, it's very small, and you'll be able to spend a good day there. Thank you very much.